All right. I hope you brought a Bible. If you don't have one, I would like for you to go get one off the back table so you can follow along with us today. If you need one, we'll bring you one. Just raise your hand. I'll have uh, Jake. There you go, Jake. You can bring a couple of Bibles over there. I'd like for you to make your way to the book of Jeremiah with me, if you would. Chapter 12 today. Jeremiah chapter 12. We're going to be in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to read a number of verses over there. That's why I'd like for you to be there with me as we, as we go through some of these verses. We'll begin in Jeremiah chapter 12. And we're going to begin with one verse. Jeremiah 12. And verse 5, God speaks to Jeremiah the prophet, and he said, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do? in the swelling of Jordan. I want to talk about running with horses today. This is an illustration God actually draws from a, a, military, a military picture, a picture of how an army perhaps is, a, is laid out. You've got footmen. If you've run with the footmen, the footmen would be your infantry, you know. These are your foot soldiers. These are the ones who, who run ahead with sword and spear and shield and so forth. And then you've got the horses. If you, you've got the footmen, you've got the horses, and of course the horses carry the, the horsemen. And a horse is a much more formidable enemy than just a man on foot, a man on a horse. Well, you know, a military horse. Uh, was a formidable weapon. It, uh, even in our own cavalry back in, uh, in the 1800s and so on, a, 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 a cavalry horse was specially bred. I mean, they weighed a thousand pounds. You got a thousand pound horse and a rider on it, that, that's a formidable weapon. In, in medieval times, the horses that carried the armored knights and all that, those were specially bred. Some of those horses were 1,400 pounds. So it's one thing to face a man on foot, you know, you're eye to eye, and you're, you're facing him, maybe you have to contend with him. But it's a whole other thing when a 1,400-pound horse that's covered with armor is racing towards you at 30 miles an hour, and you're, a, you're on foot, and this horse is galloping straight towards you. Well, the horsemen, those were formidable. That, that was a powerful weapon in ancient times. You know, if you're, a, if you're fighting from horseback, you've got the height advantage. You've got the weight advantage, the sheer bulk, the sheer size, the sheer terror advantage. You've got the strength advantage. You've got the speed advantage. So, again... A formidable weapon. Amen. But God is asking Jeremiah a question. And God's question is, if you've run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, when everything is well, that wearies you, how will you do in the swelling of Jordan. This, uh, this last part of the verse is sometimes translated like, if, you, if you're having trouble running on a, in an open field, what are you going to do when you've got to run through a forest or bushes or reeds growing all on side of the Jordan River? How are you going to do with that? If, if you can't overcome when it's clear, what will you do when it's difficult? So, you see, Jeremiah here is complaining a little bit. Uh, and none of us ever have any real justification for complaint to God. But if anybody did, it, it would have been people like Job or 
Jeremiah, because Jeremiah, Jeremiah was put through the ringer, to, be, to put it mildly. But Jeremiah here is complaining a little bit, and maybe he's even feeling a little bit sorry for himself, maybe. Because in chapter 12, he's saying, Lord, I know you're righteous. I know you're perfectly righteous in verse 1. But I just have to ask you about a few things that don't seem right to me. It don't seem fair. Jeremiah is a faithful servant. Jeremiah has lived for the Lord, has, has served the Lord faithfully. And he's looking around at how all these wicked people who are living vile, filthy, degraded, depraved, idolatrous lives, and they're doing so well. They seem so happy. They seems like everything's going well. Why? Why does the way of the wicked prosper? These are wicked people, and it seems like everything they do just it turns into money for them, and they're doing well. You've planted them. They've taken root. They grow. They bring forth fruit. And a lot of times he'll, he'll say, he says things like this. You're near in their mouth because they talk about God. Yeah, God has really blessed me. But you're far from their reins. They don't listen to you. You don't have any control over them. They just run and do whatever they want. They live like devils and they, they say God's blessing you. Amen. And, and, he, and he says in verse 3, Lord, you know me. You've seen me. You've tried my heart towards me. Pluck them out like sheep for the slaughter. <laughs> Prepare them for the day of slaughter. Well, how long is the land going to mourn like this? They were going through a time of trial. They were going through a time of difficulty in the nation. We, the, the corn, the wheat's withered, and these people are wicked. The beasts are consumed, the birds. So he's making his complaint. I think he's feeling a little bit sorry for himself. Have you ever done that in your life, you think? Maybe felt a little sorry for yourself? Like, why am I going through this? Why am I going through this? Lord, you know I love you, I serve you, I'm doing my best. I'm going to church, I'm reading my Bible. Why am I going through this? Look, they're not going through this. This guy over here, he's living like a devil, and look how he, he, he's blessed. I mean, sometimes we can feel a little sorry for ourselves. So Jeremiah's question is, why, Lord, why? why? Why are things the way they are? So God answers Jeremiah's question with a question of his own. God's question is, if you can't contend with the footman, what are you going to do with the horseman? If you can't overcome the lesser... What will you do with the greater? Yeah. Amen. It's a pretty good question. If you can't overcome the lesser trials and adversities and difficulties, what are you going to do when they get big? If you can't overcome the foot soldier trials, and look, not to minimize trials, because everybody goes through them, and, and trials are real, and afflictions and persecutions and rejection, difficulties, problems, we all go through them. That's right. And we're all soldiers. We're all supposed to be soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we're all equipped for battle, the whole armor of God. Amen. Take the whole armor of God. We've got the Word of God to use like the Lord used the Word to run the devil off. We've got the blood of Calvary, the blood of Jesus that we... We use the name of Jesus. In my name, you'll cast out devils and pray for the sick. Amen. We go through real battles. In fact, I would be, I would be, if I was a betting man, I'd be willing to bet that every single one of us is going through something. In fact, probably every single one of us is going through multiple things, multiple trials, multiple issues. And like Sister Darlene said a little while ago, when she started praying for her friends, she said, look, I got a whole list of friends. We all have a whole list of friends, family members, co-workers, neighbors, family. I mean, that we, we are praying for all the time. It's just, we're all going through trials. But I would also like to remind us all that the Lord is with us through them all. He promises to be with us through every trial. Yes. He's given us weapons to, to fight these trials. Thank you, Lord. And if we can't overcome the footman trials, 
If we can't, let, let, let me rephrase that. If we won't overcome the footman trials, because we can through Christ. Through Christ we can. But if we won't, if we, if we don't overcome the lesser trials of life, the lesser battles, then how can we contend with the greater? How can we contend with the horseman trials? Now, let me just make, make my point in case I need to make it a little clearer. If we're still at this point in our Christian life where we are sulking and whining and complaining and pouting and angry and irritable over the least things, things that we, sh we should not be losing the victory over, but you're still losing the victory over your wife cluttering something up, or your husband didn't do what you asked him to do, or somebody rubbed you the wrong way, or somebody offended you, or somebody cut in line ahead of you, if you're still getting angry over minor league, because that's what they are, minor league issues, or minor league disappointments. You know, there's some people, if things don't go their way, they don't get their way, they didn't get what they wanted, they will go into a dark depression. There are others, if they don't get their way, they get angry. Are you still getting angry at the drop of a hat? Does somebody's words still irritate you so much that you're ready to pop at any moment? Have you no control over your flesh at all? Or do you let it run wild? Are you crucifying this self? Are you crucifying the, that mouth? You know, that's what it takes. This mouth has to go to the cross. This mind has to go to the cross. you got to talk to yourself and tell yourself, I can't allow myself to think this way because, you know, if I start thinking about it, I'm going to start digging up the past. I'm going to start getting more angry and more angry until I have a volcanic explosion. If you can't run with the footman trials, these are footmen. If you can't run with the footman trials, how will you contend with the horses? You see, I believe this is the Lord not just speaking to Jeremiah, but, but the Lord speaking to us too. Or you're still losing the victory. You're still losing your temper. Still losing your joy over minor, relatively minor things. I mean, in the big picture, in the big picture, I think we could say it's pretty much all minor. The things that we stumble over. If we are, then it, right here in Jeremiah 12, 5, then God's talking to you and me too. Amen. And let's put our name right here. Rusty, if the footmen are wearing you down and you can't overcome them, how are you going to contend with the horsemen? How are you going to contend with the horsemen? You know... I want to tell us just a few things about Jeremiah that I think we should know what he was going through at the time when he was making this complaint towards God and feeling a little sorry for himself. Well, Jeremiah, we're going to, we're going to look back to chapter 1 of Jeremiah, if you don't mind. Just turn back to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah... Obviously, we know Jeremiah was a prophet. He's a prophet of God. We read in verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.1, 1, 1, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. He's a prophet, but guess what? He's a priest. He came from the priestly lineage, the Kohen. That means he's a descendant from Aaron. Now, his city, Anathoth, is a priestly city. It's a city of priests that was actually located in the, in the tribe of Benjamin. Sometimes they, were, they called him a Benjamite because the city was in the land of Benjamin. Remember the Levites, they didn't get land, but they did get cities. So he, they had a city in the land of Benjamin, Anathoth, priestly city, just a few miles, three miles from from Jerusalem. He was a prophet. In verse 4, 
The word of the Lord came to me saying, Behold, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Listen, this is true for every one of us. Amen. You are formed and fashioned by your creator Amen. You. and foreknown by your creator. Amen. I knew thee. He knew who you were, knew who you'd be before you were born, before your mother was born, or her mother, or her mother, or her mother. And before thou camest out of the womb, I sanctified thee. That is, I set you apart. I already had a plan for you. I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. You will be my prophet. You will be my servant. He was a prophet. He was a prophet of God. So, so we know that. Here's something else important for us to know about Jeremiah. Not only was he a prophet, he was a rejected prophet. Now, he's a God-called prophet. God called, God appointed, God anointed, and rejected, rejected by the multitudes. He was an unpopular prophet. He was a, he was a despised prophet. A hated prophet, to be honest. You know, a prophet's message yeah. is, is not really always the most uplifting message. It, it, it does have an uplifting element to it. But a prophet's message, a prophet's kind of like a bulldozer. They tear everything down so it can be built back right. Yeah. That's kind of what they do. Uh, but... His message was sober. Uh, remember, too, a prophet is God's spokesman. Right. While, while a priest ministers for the people to God, a prophet spoke from God to the people. And that's why when a prophet spoke and they said those four words, four powerful words that make you take notice, they're four words you'll see, they say, thus saith the Lord. Amen. This isn't my words, he'll say. This isn't my, you know, the, if Jeremiah spoke, thus saith the Lord, then you better pay attention. Amen. So, if God is going to speak directly through a human vessel to a group of people that are sinning, that are walking in open rebellion, that are practicing pagan idolatry. If God was going to speak to a people who were doing that, do you think that message would be positive and uplifting? No. Do you think the prophet would say, I'm just going to bless you all so much because I know you got a good heart? No, their message would be repent. That's what their message would basically be. Repent. And usually it had to do with idolatry. You know, you've got to repent of this idolatry and turn around and return to the law of God, return to the way of God, and serve Him only. No more compromise with this world. No more compromise with the heathen. You've got to repent. You've got to get right. So their message didn't go well with a lot of people, people who were compromised with the world. People who wanted, they wanted to believe in God. They wanted to go to the temple. They wanted to go to the tabernacle. They wanted to be blessed. But they really liked those pagan feasts. Yeah. Those heathen feasts had a lot to offer. The sensuality. The, the, yeah, everything about it really was, idolatry was attractive to the flesh. It was very attractive to the flesh. The prophet's message was, you serve God with your whole heart. You serve him and you serve him only. So people didn't like Jeremiah coming around. He, you know, he kind of was a, a, a wet blanket. They were having fun till he showed up. And then he, he had all these warnings about judgment coming right towards him, you know, like, you, you you better you better repent because this judgment is coming and it's just going to run over you like a tsunami. So he was not a popular prophet. Right. He was a prophet of God, very unpopular. 
Here's the third thing I want you to know about Jeremiah. He was a prophet to a dying nation because his nation was dying. And God had told him, God had given him a message to preach to his nation that would not make him popular at all. Jeremiah prophesied for the last 40 years of Judah's existence. He prophesied to five different kings. But Judah, the southern kingdom that the northern kingdom was already destroyed, and now Judah, the southern kingdom where Jeremiah preached and prophesied and ministered, the southern kingdom was following in the same footsteps as the northern kingdom of Israel had done. They were committing the same idolatry, the same false worship. They were doing the same things. In fact, there were times when, when God actually told Judah, you even worse than your harlot sister. You're worse than, than Israel was. And they should know better. So, are you still here in Jeremiah 1? Let's read a couple of verses. In verse 10, God tells Jeremiah, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, and here's your job, to edify, to encourage, to... Y'all follow? Here is your ministry to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down. But that's not all. To build and to plant. I saw a video not long ago of a house that had been built. It was all the framework was up, but the builders did a very defective job. The whole framework of the whole house was up, but you know they had to go in and tear the whole thing down because it was the way it was built. It wouldn't last. So they had to go in and you, you watch them tear this entire, all this work, all this money, tore it all down, had to start all over again and do it right. That's what a prophet does. Amen. The prophet tears down what's wrong, tears down what's idolatrous, tears down what's false so that it can be rebuilt on the word of God, Amen. the sure foundation of the word of God. Look, look with me to uh, yet another verse. Verse, well, verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. This is Babylon. The Lord said, right, I mean, this is right out the gate, right at the beginning of his ministry. God's telling him, the, the enemy's coming from the north. Excuse me, and they're going to break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord, and they will come. And they will, sh they will set everyone his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem and against all the walls thereof round about and against all the cities of Judah. When Babylon comes and the nations along with them, when it talks about them setting their thrones at the entering of the gates, you know, that's where the government took place, at the gates, in the, in the opening of the gates. So the government, these, these other governments are going to set themselves up in the gates of Jerusalem. It, the whole city will be conquered, the whole city, the walls, everything destroyed. So that's what we've kind of been dealing with in, in the book of Nehemiah, because after... Babylon came and destroyed those walls. They laid waste for 70 years until men like uh, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied all through the end of it till, till Nehemiah would come years later and, and rebuild the walls. That's what we've been talking about. Amen. So verse, where am I? Let's read verse 16. I'll utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and who have burned incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. Worshiping the works of their own hands, you know, they formed idols. They fashioned idols, whether they made them of clay or stone or wood or carved them in elephant tusk ivory, whatever they did, you're worshiping something that 
that you made. So they're going to fall. Israel, Judah's going to fall. They're going to fall because of their idolatry. And then he tells, in verse 17, he tells Jeremiah, so button up, buttercup. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise. You get up and speak unto them everything I tell you. And do not be dismayed at their faces, lest I confound you before them. I'll break you up if you don't go do what I told you to do. Gird up your loins. You know what that is? Tighten up. Tighten up your belt. Get out there and speak what I tell you to speak. And you know they're not going to like it. Their faces are going to reveal <laughs> that they don't like what you say. But you tell them. He says, and, and behold, I'll make you this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes, against the priests, and against the people of the land. You know what he's telling them here in these verses? None of these people are going to like you, Jeremiah. In verse 19, and they shall fight against you. Who's the they? Everybody. He just talked about the kings of Judah, the princes of Judah, the priests, the people. They will fight against you. Your own people will fight against you. But they won't prevail because I'm with you to deliver you. I'll make you strong. The princes, the priests, the people, the kings, everybody's against Jeremiah. And it doesn't mention the prophets in this particular verse, but later on we'll read plenty about the prophets who were against Jeremiah as well. Because you know why? The prophets were false. That's right. That's right. Not, they weren't all false, but the majority of the prophets were false. And they would oppose Jeremiah tooth and nail. But God says to him, look, I'll make you strong, verse 19, they will not prevail against you. Because I am with you, you have all the grace, all the strength you need for the task that I give you. Amen. Now, Jeremiah wasn't going to go out and intentionally infuriate everybody. But his ministry would not be popular. No. Not with the masses of people. In fact, they hated him and, and they plotted to kill him. But because of those four words I mentioned a little while ago, Thus saith the Lord. Because of those four words, they were afraid of him. They weren't afraid because, you know, he called down fire like Elijah or worked powerful miracles like Elijah and Elisha. You know why they were afraid of him? Because when he spoke, he spoke with the authority and the conviction of God. When he spoke, it was thus saith the Lord. He didn't. He didn't mince his words. His messages were so different from the messages of the false prophets, the false prophets of, uh, that looked over a sinful nation and said, these are good times. The Lord has surely blessed you. Peace and prosperity is ahead for you. Success and fame is what God's got planned for you. Jeremiah came right behind him and said, God's got other plans for you than success and prosperity. The, the prophets that were popular said, God, most of all, wants you to just be happy. Right. He just wants you to be happy. He wants you to be whatever makes you feel good, you know. Then, yeah. But the Jeremiah came and said, uh, no, what God wants for you to be is holy. And, and for you to serve him with all of your heart, to surrender your life to him completely and obey him. Right. And when you do, he'll bless you. You'll be happy. But if you pursue happiness, you're pursuing indulgences of the flesh, then you wind up sinning against the holy God. So, so in chapter 2, I'm just, again, going to read a couple of verses. Verses 4 and 5. Let me just read a few verses. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. And there's those four words again. Thus saith the Lord, 
What iniquity have your fathers found in me that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and have become vain? They're chasing after vanity, emptiness, things that don't matter. Empty men preaching empty words, leading empty lives. Verse 7, I brought you to a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? They that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Now, you talk about an indictment against the entire system, the, the entire religious system. The entire religious system, the religious leaders, those that handle the law. Who were these? These were the Torah, the Torah teachers. These were the priests. Because that was their responsibility to instruct in the law. That's what the priest was supposed to do. Besides other priestly duties. But they, they were the, the teachers. That was their office. And here's what God said about those who are teaching the law. They don't know me. They don't know me. You know, I'm going to tell you. I, I believe there's people preaching the word. Preaching the word that don't know the Lord today. And how, I mean, I don't want to be judgmental, but I hear some of the things they say, and I have to I come to the conclusion, they, they really don't know the Lord at all. They don't know their Bible, to say the least. I, I believe before somebody gets up and starts preaching away, they ought to know a little bit about the Bible. They ought to know something about the God of the Bible. Because if they don't, then they start saying silly things foolish things. They never get a good, a good foundation in the scriptures. So those who handle the law, the teachers, they don't know me. The pastors, these are the shepherds. They're living in sin against me. They transgress against me. And the prophets, now these are the ones who are supposed to be saying, thus saith the Lord, they are prophesying by Baal. Wow. Prophesying by Baal. Prophet, they, they have become prophets of Baal rather than prophets of God. Prophets of idolatry. They're supposed to be calling people to return to the God of the Bible. And instead, these lying prophets are drawing their inspiration from demons. Baal was the, you know, the sun god, a big demon. Over in chapter 5... I'm going to read a verse or two over here, uh, Jeremiah chapter 5, if you want to turn with me there. Jeremiah 5 and verse 30, a wonderful, actually an astonishing and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their own means. And my people love to have it so. And what will you do? What will you do in the end thereof? Prophets and priests were conspiring to support one another's evil. And, and God is saying, this is an astonishing thing. Priests and prophets, all corrupt, prophesying, preaching falsely, and the people love it. What does that say about the people's discernment? Let me tell you, God's going to hold these religious leaders accountable, but he will also call, hold accountable every person who should be discerning because we we have a responsibility to discern what's being said we have a responsibility to listen to see if what they're saying is right if it's true and to reject what is false in chapter 6 let's look at a couple of other verses in verse 10 
To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. This, this verse is very powerful and I think very relevant in our own generation. Who will listen to these warnings? Verse 10. Who am I going to warn, and, and who will hear? Who will listen to these warnings? Their ear is un uncircumcised. They cannot hearken. It's like they, they can't even compute. You tell them judgment is at the door. That You tell people today, the Lord is coming soon. They, people have been saying that for centuries. But notice, they behold the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is unto them. A reproach. Wow. Some versions translate it, the word of the Lord is unto them offensive. Others say it's a disgrace. Others say it's a shame. And that's because that, all of that is what the word reproach means. So the word of the Lord to them is something to be ashamed of? or It's ridiculous if it's offensive to me? Well, look, you've got a lot of people today who will tell you the Bible is offensive to them. It's offensive to my sensibilities because, you know, maybe they're a homosexual. And I was made this way, they say. I, I was made this way. And the Bible says, you were, you were, you were born, but you were born with a sinful nature, a fallen nature that, that inclined you to sin, plunged you into sin. And you are the way you are because sin made you that. But God will make you new. God will make you a new creation. So, but the word of the Lord is an offense to many. It's an offense to the scholars. It's an offense to the professors. It's, a, it's an offense to so many who ridicule everything the Bible says. And then notice this statement at the end of verse 10. They have no delight in it. I would translate it, they do not desire it. They have no desire for the word of God. One version translates it, they, they take no pleasure in it. The word is no delight to them. The word of God should be a delight to us. In fact, you should sit down with your Bible and when you open it up, it should just be fresh air. Better than breathing clean country air. Open up your Bible, and it's like, ah, let me just read the words of the Lord. Let me hear the words of the Lord. But this, is, this is the way it should be, but it's not the way it often is. Verse 13, who, who is guilty of this? Well, he said, from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. You can't trust any of them. You can't trust the prophets. You can't trust the priests. That was in yesterday's paper, I think. Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't yesterday, it was last week, so the week before that. But the message, in other words, is, is the same. Verse 14, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Healing, healing the hurt slightly. The, the word hurt means to be fractured, to be broken. Uh, so it speaks, here's the picture it paints. A person who's been terribly, terribly injured. A person with broken bones and, and big, gaping, bleeding wounds. And they've healed their hurts slightly. That is, they, they put a Band-Aid on a broken bone and, uh, and say, peace, peace. You're good. It's a picture of what the prophets were doing to a sinful nation, a nation that was broken in sin, that was morally, spiritually bankrupt, and the prophets were healing their hurts slightly. See, when they should have been saying, look, repent. Get right with God. What they were saying is peace, peace. That is, God's going to bless you. Everything is good. You're all right with God. 
you are all right with God. You, you, there is no call to return to the Lord. That's, that's the point. They, they see a sinful nation, but there's no call to repentance. People have wandered from the word of God, no call to return to the law. Just the opposite is true. You all still with me? Yes. Verse 15, when they were ashamed, I'm in chapter 6, 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. That's the way it is today. You, they don't even blush over their sins anymore. They're proud. They march their, their uh, pride, their prideful sins right down the street. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They'll be cast down, says the Lord. Thus, there's those four words. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. We're not going to go that way. Tell them, look, this is the straight way. This is the old path. This is the Bible way. Let's follow the Word of God. Let's follow the Word of God. They said, we're not doing that. We're not going back to that. We've left all that bondage behind. We're happy now. We're happy now and we're free. I want to read another passage in chapter 7. And verse... He's talking about the people of the land. He says, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense to Baal and walk after under other gods that you know not? And then you come and stand before me in this house, that is the house of God, which is called by my name and say we're delivered to do all these abominations? Really? Really? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, says the Lord. So, so verse 9, they, they lie, steal, murder, commit adultery. They burn incense to, to Baal. They walk after other gods. Every kind of wickedness and idolatry. And then they come to the house of God. And they believe that God has given them liberty to live like devils. Wow. We've got people like that right now. They yeah. believe we live under grace, and because we live under grace, yeah. we can live any kind of way we want, and, right. and God don't care. God. Because you're saved no by grace. You're not saved by obedience. or We believe we're saved by grace. We believe we're saved by faith. We believe if your faith is real and you've got real grace, you'll change your life. The Lord will change your life. If your life hasn't changed, you haven't been saved. By their fruits, you will know them. If your life is still, verse 9, you steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely, burn incense to bed, walk after other gods, living for yourself, selfish, ungodly, wicked, immoral, reprobate, then how can you say the Lord, the Lord gave you liberty to live that way? Absolutely not. I have a, a little footnote in my Bible that said, these people were committing all kinds of sins, and then on the Sabbath day they came to the temple and stood before God, deluding themselves into thinking they were secure in God's love for them. The same sort of theology is in evidence today when people who live in rebellion against God and His commandments feel secure because they believe that no matter how they live, that they're okay with God. Here's an interesting verse, same chapter, verse 16, where God tells Jeremiah, Therefore, pray not for this people. Neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me. I will not hear you. Don't even pray for them anymore. Don't you see what they're doing, verse 17, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? Look at what they're doing. The children gather wood. The fathers kindle the fire. The, woman, the women knead the dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. 
and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. The whole family is involved in idolatry. They're all, they got the kids involved because it's fun. Yeah. Idolatry is fun. Idolatry caters to the flesh. You got the whole family involved in idolatrous practices. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And this is what God's saying. I, don't even pray for them. Don't even pray for yeah. these people anymore. That, that's pretty bad. In chapter 7, I want to read another verse or two over here. Verse 27. Therefore shalt thou speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. They, thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer. But you will say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receives correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Wow. I'm calling you to go call them to repentance, but they won't listen. And because they won't listen, then their future is death. Verse 30, For the children of Judah... Now, this is the nation, the southern kingdom. They've done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. They're violating even basic commandments against idolatry and putting abominable, disgusting images and so forth in the house of God and polluting it, building the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. It was a, a high area in the, in the valley of Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that will no more be called Tophet, nor the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they shall bury in Tophet till there be no places. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the air and the beast of the earth. He goes on and says in verse 34, Now how would you like to preach this message to, let's say, any city in the United States? I'm going to cause to cease from the cities of the United States, let's say, and from the streets of whatever city, the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, because the land's going to be desolate. This is Jeremiah's message. Think about this. Your cities that right now are so alive with people, they're dressed gaily, you know, all fancy. They're going to parties. They're going to this thing or that thing. They're going to weddings. They're just happy, go lucky, drinking, carrying on. Party. But he says all that laughter in the streets of Jerusalem, the laughter, there's going to be no laughter. There'll be no more laughter. There'll be no more gladness. You won't hear the voice of the bride or the bridegroom. You know, that's a happy time. You won't hear any of that. Why? Because the land will be desolate. It'll be barren. Yeah. This is God telling Jeremiah, this is what I'm going to do to this land. No wonder he was an unpopular prophet. <laughs> but not only was he a prophet of God, a real prophet, a genuine prophet, not only was he an unpopular prophet, not only was he a prophet to a dying nation, but fourthly, Jeremiah was also, is also perhaps best known for being what's called a weeping prophet. A weeping prophet. Because his heart was broken, broken over the sins of, of his people, broken over the sins of those he loved. Just like it breaks your heart to see people you love living in sin, so blind, That's right. so foolish, so bound up yeah. by vices of all kinds. You, you can't tell me that doesn't make you grieve. Yeah, yeah. You can't tell me that if you have the heart of the Lord and you see people living in this, these kind of lifestyles, it breaks your heart. That's right. it, it really does. It breaks your heart. So he, he is called the weeping prophet. In, in fact, I want you to look with me one more chapter over, chapter 9. I'm, I'm making my way back to chapter 12. I'm almost there. <laughs> chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head 
were waters in my eyes, fountains of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. I, his heart is so broken. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them, because they're all adulterers. They're all a, a city, a, an assembly of treacherous men, false men, fake. They bend their tongues like their bow for lies, but they're not valiant for the truth upon the earth. They proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. They don't know. You know what he's longing for? Verse 2, I wish I had a little cabin in the woods somewhere. That I could just get away from these wicked people. I just need to get away from them. Just for a little while. And then... In chapter 13, I want you to turn here with me, if you would, because I said he's a weeping prophet. This, there's a verse over here that just jumped out at me this week, and I just want you to look at it here with me. In chapter 13 and verse 17, this is Jeremiah. He's, his desires for the people to just repent and serve the Lord. He said, but if you will not hear, if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. You know why this just jumped out at me? Because when it talks here about if you're not going to turn to the Lord, and repent of your sins. My soul shall weep in secret places. My soul, that's me. And you know what he's saying here? I will cry alone. I'll cry alone. And what is he going to cry over? I'm crying over a people who will not repent. I'm crying over a family that will not turn from sin. My my eyes will weep sore. I'm praying. I'm, I'm crying in secret places. So he's all alone. Nobody's with him. I'll cry alone for your pride. That is over your sins. And I'm going to cry alone for your sins today and tomorrow. I'm going to cry alone over your destruction. Because if that's, that's what it will be if you don't repent. Repent of your sins. I'll cry alone today for your sins, and tomorrow I'll cry alone because you've been destroyed by the hand of God. I guess when you preach against everything that people love, it doesn't particularly endear you to their hearts. But here's a man who says, I'll cry alone in secret. I, wanna, I want you to just stop for a minute and just think about this. The man opposed by pretty much everything and everyone, he had no wife because God told him not to get married. Don't get married, don't have any children. Chapter 16, he said, you're, that's not your call. You're not getting married, you're not having no children. So he, he, he was a solitary man uh, preaching an unpopular message to a people who didn't like him very much. Their religious leaders, all the religious leaders opposed him. In fact, not only did the religious leaders indulge in the same sins, they kind of led the way, you know, uh, for others to sin as well. Jeremiah felt like he stood alone. I'll cry alone, he said. I think sometimes we all might cry alone or pray alone. Amen. Sometimes we all might think we're all alone. Jeremiah thought he was all alone, uh, but you know he wasn't. He Just like Elijah wasn't all alone. He thought he was all alone. God said, no, I've got 7,000 others who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. God's always got a remnant. Don't, don't ever doubt that. He's always got a remnant people. But if things weren't as bad already... Then Jeremiah found out about a plot to kill him, a plot that came from his own, his own hometown, Anathoth, and his own people 
right from among his own family. In, in chapter 11, verses 21 through 23, the Bible speaks of this plot by the, the priests, the spiritual leaders, I mean, those in his own house. They're going to seek your life, God said in verse 21, Jeremiah 11, 21. In, in Jeremiah 12, 6, we, we read the same thing. But all of this brings me back to our text in Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. It brings me all the way back to this. God gave a name to all of the afflictions, troubles, strife, heartbreak, rejection, all the things that Jeremiah went through, everything that he experienced. And he went through a lot, right? Yeah. God gave a name to everything he went through, all the things we just read, the rejection, the hatred, the opposition, everybody opposing. God called his experience footmen. He said, if you can't contend with the footman, what will you do with the horseman? If you can't run with the footman, what will you do with the horses? If everything Jeremiah went through all the way up to chapter 12 was footmen, then what are our trials? You know, I read verse, this verse right here, chapter 12, verse 5, and it tells me, Rusty, God expects you to be an overcomer in these footman trials. He expects you to overcome. He expects you to run, to contend, and to overcome these footman trials. Whatever form these trials take, whatever your problem, whatever your circumstance, no matter how much you've been hurt, offended, wounded, rejected, opposed, vexed, hindered, slandered, no matter what, no matter what you're going through physically or in your family or whatever, God expects us to be overcomers. Amen. Crucify this flesh. Put this self to death. Die to it. Die to it. Die to it. But you don't know what they told me. Die to it. Die to it. That's all pride and ego. You don't want to defend yourself. Set the record straight. Get, get them off my back. God expects his servants to overcome the footmen. It's expected. And then he also wants us to know they got horses out there too. And if you can't overcome the footmen, what will you do with the horsemen? I don't believe we should live in fear of the horsemen. I believe we need to know that God's with us all the time to enable us to defeat any any mountain, climb any mountain, overcome any trial. I mean, but keep in mind, David had to defeat the lion and the bear before he could face the giant Goliath. And I believe the same thing is true for you and me. And look, when David faced the giant Goliath, he faced him without fear. So don't fear the footman. Don't feel like you're all alone. Don't feel like... Why is this happening to me? Because God says, it's a footman. You expected to overcome that. If you have run with the footman and they have wearied thee, we do feel weary. We do feel at times overwhelmed. We do feel at times like the whole world's against us and we want to cry alone and, and we have no friends and nobody loves me and uh, everybody opposes me and I'm feeling sorry for myself and why these other people, they're so blessed. And, and God says, a button up, buttercup. This is just a footman. That's all this is, a footman. But the horses, you know, 
They're out there. You can't defeat a footman. He gives us grace to overcome the horsemen as well. Amen. I'm quitting right there. <laughs> you mean I get, I, I get a lot of excitement when I say I'm done. <laughs> glad, that, glad that sermon's over. Either, either because everybody's bored silly and they want to go home. or no, can't Hallelujah. I'm, I, that's right. I'm going to go home and cry alone. <laughs> uh, Father, we need your mercy. We need your grace, Lord. We thank you that you are a God of mercy and grace, a, a forgiving God. And even when we falter and stumble and, and disappoint you, Lord, we know you love us and you don't cast us aside. We know, Lord, that you're with us always. And just remind us of that, that our strength is in you. Our hope is in you. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on your word, your eternal truth that never changes. Even when our circumstances change, even when things look bad, they look terrible, Lord, help us to remember to keep our eyes on you, your promises, your faithfulness, and that these are just footmen, footmen that by your grace and with your strength we can overcome. That we can, we can be crucified with Christ. Lord, help us to live this life with the realization that we're not living for ourselves. But we're living for you. And you give us the strength, the grace that we need to overcome in all of our trials. Whatever they be. Help us, Lord, to walk by faith and not sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may now exhale.